I will start with a very general introduction where I come from and also uh, just you know general overview how the EU policy making work just one slide and then uh, I will present uh, Europe 2020 that is the current midterm strategy because I think it is important to locate the European climate policy in the context of the overall strategy then you will see uh, various uh, strat uh, strategic planning like low carbon roadmap, uh, 2020 uh, climate and energy package, 2030 policy framework. Uh, I'm not going to detail that, but the point is that we have to see how the, the policy making evolve over a period of time. And then where people are thinking and rethinking how to adjust depending on the different economic and political circumstances. Because, for example, when uh, the Europe decided on the 2020 uh, targets for uh, greenhouse gas emissions, energy efficiency, and so on, at that time, people were still very hopeful about the outcome of the Copenhagen. Also, they were not really feeling strong about the impact of the economic recession. So that figures, uh, they realized soon that that figures don't make much sense. So they have to adjust when the, the period of the targets they decided actually take into effect. So I'm pretty sure that in Israel and other countries, that kind of, you know, uh, very difficult uh, uh, adjustment happens from time to time. And I think today I, I will be able to present just example how to cope with it. Um, this is a very quick introduction uh, about my organization. So we are um, a private independent think tank based in uh, Brussels, one of the biggest one. And also uh, the unique feature is that we don't just focus on environmental policy, but already for 25 years we are looking across different policy uh, areas. And my team, when I joined, was more or less two or three persons. Now it evolved into 10 people. And especially for the last couple of years, we expanded the energy team because of the significance. In fact, when I arrived in Brussels in 2020, sorry, 2002, um, I started uh, initially uh, working as a trainee for the European Commission on the EU-Russia energy dialogue. So uh, at that time, um, still um, the competence, so-called the, the influence of the policy-making power was mainly at EU member states, not on, at the European Commission. So it was very decentralized only you know, 10 years ago. After, for example, Russia uh, started using you know, uh, their uh, supply power on the gas pipelines and so on, European people started feeling the impact. So uh, somehow member states got together. We cannot just you know, leave the, the uh, energy policy making to member states, they have to coordinate. So gradually over a period of time, now that the uh, policy making on the energy issues shifted from member states to the European Commission. Uh, this is just to give a context and I'm working in the energy and climate change program. So how do EU institutions and the EU policy making process work? Maybe some of you are more familiar with me, but um, uh, maybe it's in, in, interesting to make a point um, because I'm originally from Japan and I didn't know all those details about difference depending on the, even the uh, policy areas. So, uh, in principle, um, as far as the policy concerns EU domestic issues like emissions trading, regulations, that would be subject to co-decision by the Council of the Ministers and the European Parliament. That means that um, uh, senior officials of member states and uh, European Parliament uh, members uh, together have to uh, uh, agree on the proposal uh, submitted by the European Commission. On the other hand, for international climate change negotiations, it is the, the Council of the Ministers who give the Commission a mandate to negotiate in the UNFCC. 
So, uh, for example, the parliament power is rather limited to EU domestic policies in climate change. However, they tend to send a delegation to the UNFCC almost every COP, so every conference of um, parties. So in that sense, uh, there are a number of parliamentarians who are closely monitoring, but not necessarily influencing the way uh, international climate change negotiations can be conducted at the EU level. So now I'm starting climate policy in the EU context. Uh, the current uh, mid-term strategy for Europe across policy area is called Europe 2020, and that was ori originated on the Lisbon strategy, focusing on long-term competitiveness. So this is very much um, uh, econo economics-oriented, and also focusing on growth, industrial competitiveness, uh, job creation, and so on. Europe 2020 has uh, overall uh, goals of uh, smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. So there is a lot of social aspect in it, but today, because of my focus on climate and energy sustainability, uh, I'm not going to introduce all the goals, but I just highlighted several uh, interesting uh, objectives on the em employment, research and development, and especially climate change and energy sustainability. So under this climate change and energy sustainability, we have three different targets set under the uh, 2020 package that was agreed in 2008 and then uh, became a law in 2009. And there are several different flagship initiatives and under sustainable growth, we have so-called resource efficient Europe. And under resource efficient Europe, key proposals include low carbon economy 2050 roadmap and also 2030 framework on climate and energy. Now the status of low carbon uh, economy is rather, um, uh, uh, not rather unsettled because of the uh, object objection from one of the member states. They couldn't get a uh, consensus over the head of state. So it has not become a law. Just to uh, you know, give some ideas about the, the relative weight of EU's uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, it used to be somewhere like 15%, now 13%. Project is to fall further down to 10% in 2020. And this is a very important point, uh, not just the figures, because increasingly this figure is used that EU should, of course, uh, remain the, the leader of the climate change uh, initiatives, but there is a limit about the impact we could give on the global scale. And on top of it, uh, especially after two uh, waves of uh, economic recessions in the five years, uh, intra-European disparity is highlighted, and that's not just economic, but also social. So there, there, has, uh, there have been gaps between EU15 and new member states, so-called, that includes former Soviet Union countries, Bulgaria, Romania, Malta, Cyprus, uh, Croatia. And there, are, there is a huge variance in terms of uh, you know, uh, income, GDP per capita, but also the energy mix, uh, the, the composition of the power generation. And uh, Poland has a particular problem because of their uh, energy sources, predominantly coal-based. And also, uh, interestingly, because of the, where they are, they, are, they have more mitigation potential for the future, and that also means more investment opportunities for cleaner energy technologies. Excuse me. So uh, where are we now? On our way towards 2050 or on our way towards 2030? Uh, EU is meeting two of the three targets they set, um, let's say, five years ago. And reducing greenhouse gas emissions, yes. And they have, a, um, they have been largely helped by the um, decline in economic growth 
because of the recession, naturally the emission uh, levels have become much lower than they were expected. That also means that they didn't need to, for example, um, purchase emission rights, which I'm going to tell a little bit later. Initially, they, uh, they are, people, people thought that there would be a gap between the, the cap on emissions and what the, the level of actual <coughs> mitigation actions. But because of the lower economic activities, their emissions were naturally lower, and therefore they didn't need to buy more. So already we thought just you know, three years ago, well, 2020 uh, figures are not target anymore. It, it was just clear that they don't need to do anything. Uh, in, in comparison, renewables uh, performance uh, still has some difference between member states. But if we take the average, EU is likely to meet 21% uh, uh, renewables okay. target. The only problem is energy efficiency. And there has been some you know, uh, uh, pressure from the European Parliament and also interested citizens to set binding targets for energy efficiency, but in the end it didn't work. Now we started looking at some scenarios uh, and also um, f sort of uh, um, uh, assumptions in order to uh, formulate uh, longer term strategies, but there are certain features which wouldn't change radically depending on the scenarios or assumptions. One of them is that whatever we do, energy costs in Europe will likely rise in all scenarios until 2030, because, uh, primarily because the power generation capacity is very old, and especially coal-powered uh, generation capacity. Uh, about climate change, uh, this is, these are of course not an assumption, it's more to show where we are now. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions target is ambitious, uh, but this rather counts on the good performance of emissions trading scheme, because even in earlier targets, uh, majority of the, the carbon constraints were placed on so-called ETS sectors, that is power, industry, aviation. Compared with it, um, so-called sectors outside, sectors not covered by the emissions trading scheme, uh, were still left to member states. So there is not much control uh, from the European Commission. And member states are responsible to, to make it sure that they will meet the targets. Uh, so this is rather a sort of a standard uh, view in the European uh, Commission and also uh, our organization. I have some personal reservation about the you know, um, role of the ETS, Emissions Trading Scheme, uh, but I will just uh, you know, show how people are expecting and how people are looking into it. So this is always considered to be flagship of EU climate policy and that is to achieve the mitigation objectives in the low cost uh, way. But increasingly, uh, even though initially people agreed that this is one best way to achieve the Kyoto target, the focus somehow shifted from the mitigation to uh, rather supplementary uh, objectives. And one of them is potential for financial transfer and another was to create incentives for investments on technology and innovation by setting a price. But here, already people have different views because, for example, for industry, it is always good to have a low uh, emission price, sorry, low, uh, low allowance price, whereas for power sector, it is always good to have higher price Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for them to invest. Now, globally, still European Commission is quite a uh, firm that uh, this is the best scheme to create a global carbon price or a range of uh, similar prices through linking markets. And then <coughs> by involving other countries, this, is, uh, this will address EU industry's competitiveness concerns because people are supposed to play on the equal uh, 
level playing field. And uh, besides the main advantage to create a major source of financial transfers, which is required as under the U UN uh, negotiations right now. Uh, so we are uh, in the third phase right now, after the pilot phase in 2005 and 2007, then we had uh, overlap with the Kyoto Protocol's first commitment period. Now we are starting the two, um, phase three. There are key assumptions. Uh, one, the important thing is that all sectors should contribute to the EU's uh, strategy to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the midterm, and uh, ETS is the main vehicle for that. And by using this, uh, these uh, policy instruments, uh, we can achieve cost-efficient reductions without harming the economy. And energy efficiency improvements uh, would be still low-hanging fru uh, fruits uh, because of this, for example, old uh, power generation capacity. Uh, EU is trying to meet uh, greenhouse gas emissions targets, mostly through domestic measures. Where do, do we want to be in the long term, uh, up to 2050? Now we are trying to set milestones. So by 2050, uh, as IPCC recommended, EU is trying to reduce emissions by 80% below 1990. To do that, by 2040, 60% reduction. By 2030, 40% reduction. And Primary, meeting the targets through domestic measures only, that means uh, limited use of international credits and offsets. So I don't know uh, how much uh, Israel is committed to, for example, clean develop me development mechanisms or other forms of trading, but uh, from the EU side, uh, now they, uh, they already set uh, several conditions what kind of credits will be accepted for compliance with the EU's own trading scheme. And then this policy will not likely change for the next decade. And transition through innovation and investment in clean technologies and low carbon uh, energy, that will be also instrumental to this strategy. The problem is uh, somehow there is a now gap between 2050 and 2020. And how to fill the gap by setting a new framework for 2030? That is the current uh, state of discussion. And especially after the economic recession, now this competitiveness is at the center of the, the um, uh, policy discussion. Although uh, today I'm not going to get into far. So uh, they recently set three targets. And there was already a discussion whether we should uh, integrate three different targets into one or keep the three separate ones. Uh, apparently, the conclusion was that we keep three different ones. For greenhouse gas emissions, 40% reduction below 1990, that is binding. And renewable energy, at least 27%, that has become binding too. But energy efficiency uh, largely is left at uh, member states. Uh, in, other, in other words, there was no strong consensus on the, the specific design or the, the level of ambition as for, uh, concerns the energy efficiency. Uh, this proposal has been coupled with a report on impacts of energy prices and costs, also proposal for market stability reserve uh, to support the emissions trading scheme. And now we, are, we just finished uh, the so-called March uh, Council. That was the EU's uh, main decision-making body. Uh, leaders should agree to take a final decision in October. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the same points which I already addressed uh, about this binding greenhouse gas emission targets in 2030. Uh, there are some tricks how to you know, fit the design itself to, um, to uh, set this 40% goal. So the, there are some minor details like you know, reduction in the so linear factor on the emissions trading scheme, uh, how to uh, 
set non uh, emissions trading sectors uh, emissions level. Um, now, the interesting thing is that this binding target is meant um, primarily for EU internal purposes. So um, the idea is to agree in this uh, summit in October internally whether we could make it actually international pledge. If we succeed that um, uh, EU could set in, um, national pledge in October uh, 2014, then that will be most likely presented as international pledge in early 2015 to meet this UNFCC uh, negotiation requirements. Uh, about renewable targets, uh, in the previous period, I, uh, the target was set on a country basis. Finally, it is now set at the EU level, but in practice, still, because uh, member state has uh, uh, power in energy policy making, um, member states have a discretion to decide their own targets. So the idea is to have, uh, on average, 27% at the EU level, but how to do it? They are not going to break down into national targets in a centralized way. Rather, member states have to make their own efforts. In the context of, of the climate policy, uh, reform of EU emissions trading scheme is important. Um, I recall that in the morning discussion, uh, the last speaker said that um, now the market collapsed uh, two or three years ago, uh, the price is too low. I totally agree. Uh, EU has, has been making effort how to address this issue. And one of the solution after long negotiation was to set up a so-called market stability reserve, uh, enter into force in 10 years. Uh, this should address surplus of emission allowances automatically and also strengthen the resilience of the system to unforeseen sh economic shocks like uh, you know, a financial crisis in this decade. I will skip these principles. The next step is, for, so, so in order to uh, help the, the um, heads of state in October, we have to follow several you know, steps uh, agreed. And I think the first one is very important to analyze the implication of these uh, targets proposals for individual member states because each country has its own economic, social, and political circumstances. And uh, that has to be taken into account in this uh, process. Uh, now I'm switching to uh, the role of the EU in the world, especially in terms of EU external relations on the climate change, and also UN uh, framework uh, convention. As I see it, there are two factors external to climate policy. I, as I already um, indicated, there are big impacts of the recent crisis on economic and f financial aspects at member states and the EU levels. Uh, especially this collapse of the carbon markets uh, led to sort of soul searching what to do because they assumed that the, the carbon pricing is the best way to meet the, the long-term goals. The second surprise was availability of shale gas in the US, maybe much less reported, but uh, this was a sort of a double shock to the European industry because uh, they view that electricity price suddenly <coughs> rose, but that was not because, not necessarily because of the carbon constraints. On the contrary, carbon price went down, but still and electricity prices went up. And with this condition, they feel that they have to compete with the US industry. And this is a big issue. And the last surprise was security of energy supply popping up again triggered by uh, the political situation in Ukraine. Um, I think it is still too early to discuss the potential impact of that, 
but uh, security of energy supply will be uh, now uh, certainly uh, playing a role in our uh, process to reach agreement on these three set, uh, I mean three targets uh, towards 2030. Now, on the other hand, there are problems which are internal to climate policy, no matter what happened in other policy areas. So one of the issues over supply of allowances have been already addressed by uh, reforming the ETS design. But still, there is a lack of major demand out outside emissions trading scheme. And this is fundamental because uh, Unlike the Kyoto Protocol's first period, not, ma not many major economies are committed yet. And at least, uh, it, as far as it is concerned with the Kyoto Protocol, e EU feels that uh, other developed countries are not committed enough. Um, so we have to keep a watch on it. And the last point is uncertainty about design of new market mechanisms that is under the uh, negotiation for the United, uh, sorry, UN Framework Convention. Uh, because, uh, as I will, they will j shortly, uh, the progress in the UNFCC towards 2015 agreement is so slow that we haven't even started what kind of elements should con constitute this architecture. And one of them is new market mechanisms. So there is a still remaining uncertainty and how we uh, tr make a transition from the you know, former Kyoto Protocol uh, mechanisms to these ones, we are not uh, sure yet. Uh, this is just about competitiveness, so I'm not going to get into that. Well, one thing we cannot forget is that um, even though EU is reforming, redesigning policies and measures to achieve their own targets, this could have impact on uh, neighboring countries, also uh, pa international partners in a close trade relations or investment relations. Uh, risk of or possibility for border measures in the emissions trading scheme having uh, policymakers in mind for already a couple of years, just as a concept never seriously discussed as a policy option, but that would never disappear either. So we have to be careful about it. And uh, uh, um, I'm not sure how much uh, sh uh, the, the Israel's uh, share of uh, E, uh, trade with uh, bilateral trade with e Israel, uh, EU, but uh, this could have some implications. The second part is intercontinental aviation. Um, and also the third point is maritime. Um, EU has tried to somehow cover inter intercontinental aviation under the EU emissions trading scheme because of the slow progress in uh, ICAO uh, however, in the end, after all those uh, comments from other countries, uh, EU has uh, reiterated its position that uh, still international bodies should make a first decision. Uh, EU is, in the end, uh, not trying to force it, but uh, I, I, it is not clear to me as a researcher how this can be settled in the end. We have to still monitor the progress um, in the international uh, negotiations. Uh, there are potential areas of EU interests in different areas, uh, while the UN-led negotiations are rather slow in progress. The first one is short-lived climate pollutants that includes black carbon, uh, methane, ozone, and so on. And there is an increasing interest. Uh, I think that Israel is also part of the countries who are committed to make an alliance of uh, um, interested parties across countries, across regions. And uh, this could be a, a game changer in order to uh, involve uh, big emitters such as China, India, also other so-called uh, middle-income countries. The second point is, yes. Green growth, uh, already uh, there, there has been mentioned in the previous uh, uh, presentations. Green growth would be also a game changer because uh, in 
taking this as a reference point, you could bring in uh, you know different constituency to support the policy process. One could be you know uh, technology and innovation community. Another could be you know job creation, also trade union. We could have uh, probably more you know integrated approach as far as we can set the right focus. The problem is that green growth concept itself tends to just walk on its way. And I read an article by American researchers, academics, that green growth could be used like a theologic concept. Um, however, if we could, uh, for example, articulate what kind of policy options are available and how we approach it, this could be a very interesting uh, project for, for which uh, people can work together. The third point is research and innovation, and the EU just launched a big f funding scheme called Horizon 2020. So here, uh, actually, we have been working uh, right now uh, to submit lots of proposals. This is not only restricted to uh, uh, European research institutes, but also to other countries. Thank you for inviting me to the conference. We've had good cooperation with the Porter School in the past. A couple of years ago, we had uh, Lisa Jackson, our Environmental Protection Agency Administrator, who spoke in this same hall about a similar subject. And I certainly don't profess to be an expert on her level, because I cover very many different issues uh, in the embassy. But I will try to give you some sense of where US government policy uh, is currently and, and what the future plans are. Uh, I should start out by saying that my office, a very small unit, we cover a wide range of issues in Israel. We uh, do environmental policy, science and technology, which is a huge issue in and of itself, as well as uh, health policy. My colleague, Lynn Morin, we're a two-person operation for the most part, um, help put the put this preparation together. Neither of us are deep into the subject, so um, I hope you'll be kind to me and not ask me too many very difficult questions. But uh, for those that I can't answer, we will certainly come back and, and get you an answer. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is a little bit of a different approach than my colleague from the European Union. I'm going to really focus on the problem of resilience and the problem of changing climates in the US. Because uh, this has been uh, getting a lot of attention. It's a way of connecting this issue to the average person on the street. Uh, many of you probably know that there are actually a sizable number of Americans who don't even believe that the climate is changing. And certainly on the political level, it's been very debated. I think this is a much easier issue in Europe. I think there's much more consensus on climate change. Uh, we don't have anything uh, resembling the European trading scheme. Uh, so one of the ways I think America is sort of, if I can say, waking up to the problem or becoming more aware of the problem is through the kind of uh, unusual weather patterns we've had, particularly in the last few years. I think. Uh, most of you have probably heard about the Hurricane Sandy that we had on the East Coast. Uh, that affected many communities very directly. We've had droughts in the Midwest, uh, which has hit the farming community. Uh, droughts on the West Coast. Uh, certainly forest fires have been much more of a problem. So I think in every part of America, people are suddenly realizing there's something very strange going on with the climate. So um, I think the government is certainly looking at these uh, weather patterns, climate changes, and realizing one of the things it has to do is make sure that our communities, our states, and at the federal level, that we can not only respond when we have these disasters or these unusual weather patterns, but we can actually fortify and prepare communities so that when floods and hurricanes and uh, droughts hit, the communities are better prepared. Uh, I already actually started talking a little bit about this slide, but this is where we get into how are we responding. And that's what I really want to focus uh, my presentation on, some of the things 
we're trying to do to respond to uh, uh, climate change. And uh, I know when I started looking or following this, issues, uh, this issue back in my days in Northern Europe, we heard a lot about climate change and reducing carbon emissions and all of that. I don't think the term resilience was something that was sort of, it's becoming sort of the term of art, at least in the US, because we are in climate change, you know, and, and we're at the point now that it's not enough to just talk about reducing carbon emissions, but we have to uh, uh, prepare communities uh, and prepare uh, our own policies and programs uh, to deal with change that is already happening. Uh, so some of the things we're trying to do, we're uh, obviously establishing policy and priorities. I will go into that a little more. Critical infrastructure, natural resources. I, obviously infrastructure has to be built differently, maintained differently, fortified differently under climatic uh, change. Uh, on the science and the research side, the, well, the president uh, in the new budget, but also uh, gradually over um, the last several years, we've been putting more money into science and research. Um, the other thing is coordination. Uh, we, we need to do a better job. We, we have a very messy uh, government sometimes when it comes to issues like climate change because it doesn't fit neatly into anybody's portfolio. We have 25 different agencies uh, involved in these issues. We have the state government, we have local governments. Uh, and getting these different parts of the government to coordinate is, is sometimes very challenging. Um, there are three, I think, key recent uh, uh, sort of elements uh, to our policy. Uh, there's an interagency climate change adaptation, ta uh, ad uh, adaptation task force, which I will talk a little bit more about who's on it and why we set it up. It's basically an interagency body, but it's got a very important interface with the states and the local governments. Uh, there's also the President's Climate Action Plan, which is a very detailed document of step-by-step -step on what we're doing in many different areas. Uh, very sort of, um, you can get sort of a very good sense of the hands-on things that the U.S. is doing. So for those who are interested in finding out more about it, uh, the website is up there. It's an easy one. It's whitehouse.gov, um, and you can find it there. Um, and then another document from the press office, preparing the United States for the impacts of climate change. And uh, this is very much the direction that I think policy thinking is going in. How do we, how do we actually prepare when, when the problem comes? Um, the first thing I mentioned was the interagency uh, task force. This was set up recently last fall. Uh, we, uh, we have 25 uh, different agencies involved in this. Uh, th there is an interface. What, we, what was also set up was an interface with st state, local, and even tribal leaders. You know, we have a fairly major um, uh, uh, Indian reservations particularly in the Southwest, in Arizona and so forth, uh, in areas where we experience climatic problems. And it's, it's very important to also uh, get leaders from the Indian uh, reservations involved in this. And this group is basically, um, it's an advisory group, and it's a sharing of best practices. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how often they meet, but uh, these are frontline decision makers. We have governors, we have mayors, we have cabinet level officials. Uh, they meet and they try to coordinate policies on, on climate change. Um, the Climate Action Plan, which is the second uh, uh, element that I mentioned before, and that's really our roadmap. Uh, I would call the task force sort of the a body that helps, uh, helps uh, the roadmap achieve its desired result. But the Climate Action Plan, which came out last June, is, is very much of a roadmap. And it, it's got three major pillars. One, obviously, is to cut carbon pollution. 
uh, this remains an important goal, and I'll get into a little more on how we're trying to do that. But the second part is, and a very important part that's getting a lot more attention, is preparing for the impacts of climate change. And then the third part, of course, is the international uh, efforts that are underway. Um, and, you know, as, as many know uh, here, uh, many of you here know, that under the Obama administration, there is a very strong commitment to working internationally. And we are involved very much uh, in the process uh, of the UN Convention on Climate Change and had a look at a follow-on plan uh, and participating in the, uh, in the meetings, the recent one being in Warsaw. Um, so under uh, our Carbon Pollution Action Plan, which is you know, where we are actually trying to lower greenhouse gas and CO2 emissions, um, these are just key elements. There are many other things we're doing, but we're just trying to give you a, a flavor of some of the things we are doing uh, that we believe will reduce uh, carbon pollution. And that's much stricter standards for power plants, uh, and very much promoting energy efficiency projects and loan guarantees to help uh, those projects. Uh, we're also allowing uh, renewable projects on public lands. We're opening up, uh, you know, we have a very large uh, tracts of land, especially in the western um, states for national parks and other purposes. We're trying to open up parts of those lands uh, so that uh, we can um, increase our renewable projects. Um, we're also uh, trying to look at building codes and uh, increase efficiencies uh, in the way we build, uh, deal with building waste, uh, reduce carbon pollution in federal buildings. We have a much stricter codes now and policies in the federal government. Uh, de uh, developing fuel standards for heavy-duty vehicles. We have some um, fuel, st uh, fuel standards in place that have increased efficiency, and we're looking at even stricter standards for the post-2018 period. Um, overall, the goal we have is 17% uh, uh, reduction in greenhouse gases below the 2005 level, which we sort of calculated a little bit uh, differently than the Europeans. I think the Europeans in, are a little more maybe ambitious in their numbers. Uh, but we also, uh, I guess you could say, try to be realistic about where we can be. Uh, let me see. We're also, I know we're trying to double uh, our <coughs> contribution of renewables to power generation. We're trying to double that by the year 2020. Um, get, moving to the second part of the Climate Action Plan, which is preparing for the impacts of climate change. Uh, these are, I guess you could say, the key pillars, is to modernize our government programs, because a lot of the programs we have in place deal with the climate as we know it, as, is, as it has been historically. We need to look at different programs, different policies. Uh, different types of investment because we're dealing with a changed environment. Uh, we have to uh, look at our ecosystem, strengthen the resilience of our watersheds. I think uh, the Sandy hurricane very much taught us that lesson. New Orleans, when we had Hurricane Katrina, there were lots of lessons to be learned there. Um, we're also trying to educate more. I think it's very important. I think part of the effort is that the person, on, the average person on the street, feels connected with this issue. This is not just a bunch of scientists doing calculations in an ivory tower, but this affects everybody's lives. So, and we're trying to work more closely with private sector uh, decision makers so they can really understand um, the importance of coordination. Uh, and then, of course, adaptation plans. We're uh, looking at plans and how to address climate change-related uh, risks. Um, just to give you a flavor, this is just an example. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, for instance, has a plan which uh, describes how increased flooding would affect the transportation sector. 
So you have to look at these different scenarios and uh, how do you build a transportation sector differently or, or infrastructure to support that uh, to take into account, especially in coastal areas, of course. Um, then I also, I, I spoke a little bit about the uh, interagency coordination. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, touch on a little bit more uh, in this particular slide, and uh, some of these acronyms I know are, you know, like alphabet soup. But uh, DHH, DHHS is Department of Homeland Security, if people have heard of that. Uh, CDC is the Center for Disease Control. And, uh, you, you know, uh, we don't always think, okay, of these 25 agencies, you know, we, maybe we're thinking transportation or commerce or whatever. But you have everything from you know health-related agencies to you know in in a in a condition of climate change and uh, weather destructive patterns, uh, health and uh, uh, diseases are are very important part of that. So these are some of the uh, groups that are involved in in these projects, uh, and this involves because we have a very federal system, the federal government doesn't control all of this. It has to work with states, local governments. Um, this is just a, a map to give you some sense of how, um, how uh, what states, what cities are, are receiving some of this assistance at this point. Um, on investing in climate resilience, uh, that is an issue that I think particularly the Porter School asked me to look at. What What is the $1 billion climate resilience fund? The president just announced this in California a few weeks ago. Um, first of all, it's not in place yet. This is a proposal. There's always gonna be a struggle with Congress about our budget. People who follow US politics certainly know that. Uh, there are different perspectives in Congress on the importance of climate change. Not everything the president wants, the president gets. But uh, this is certainly uh, what his ambition is. I think the administration really wants to put a lot more money and resources into climate resilience. And what does that mean? <clears throat> that means everything from investing in research uh, and really getting a better handle on, on information about these climate change patterns. It's what I already partly uh, mentioned, well, I certainly mentioned uh, helping communities plan and prepare, and very important is the br uh, breakthrough on technologies. And I think here there are a lot of opportunities for uh, closer collaboration with a country such as Israel that is very advanced in in, um, in these areas. So we have, just if you sort of look at it as kind of a, in a flow manner of you have research, uh, you have community level planning, you have technology, you have infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, some of the new programming we're looking at is for instance the National Flood Insurance Program um, and uh, also looking more closely at federal and tribal lands uh, on drought mitigation and sustainable water management. We're also even emphasizing uh, issues such as ocean acidification uh, research. Because a lot of the CO, uh, greenhouse gases end up uh, affecting the oceans. Uh, the Federal Climate Change Research Program uh, just mention that because it's it's big. It's part of the uh, new resilience fund uh, uh, that the president is proposing. He's proposing increases to uh, research programs, um, and we do a lot uh, also on the international level um, in global change research. Um, uh, this is just a case study on the California drought, uh, just to give you a, a flavor of it uh, and the severity of it. You can look at those two pictures. I don't think this is the last of uh, seeing droughts in California. And uh, just because this is a very recent uh, development, this is something this year, some of the things I was talking about, such as the Hurricane Sandy happened last year. But this kind of gives you uh, a sense 
of how the federal government is responding to a recent uh, climate disaster or whatever climate uh, serious um, problem. Uh, USDA is the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the U.S. and the Department of Interior. Uh, they're looking at uh, programs, 170 million plus. They're dealing with some things like water delivery infrastructure, water management, conservation, emergency food assistance, agricultural loans, all of these things are needed to be looked at in situations such as this. Lastly, I want to touch a little bit on uh, the third pillar that I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, which is international coordination. Um, and uh, we have a very sizable budget for global engagement. Uh, I mean, obviously, we participate in the uh, talks on a new uh, climate change, uh, in the climate change convention pr uh, processes. But we also um, are very much involved in capacity building and trying to support especially um, initiatives in the third world that expand clean energy. We are, we are leading an effort uh, where we recently um, we all, it was spoke to governments around the world, including Israel's, uh, about our change policy on uh, coal-fired um, uh, energy uh, and we, we, our new policy is not to uh, support through uh, a, the international financial institutions uh, coal-fired energy plants globally anymore, unless there are some very particular circumstances like sequestration technology is used. I think there's one other exception. But that's part of how, what we're trying to do on the global scale uh, to try to um, also help and encourage other countries uh, to look for cleaner energy alternatives. <laughs> <laughs>